Hey, what is up guys? It is your boy Speed here, and today we're going to be going over the fundamentals that makes Arteezy such a good carry player. I think sometimes with the uh, insane amount of information that is available nowadays to, I guess, everyone on everything, it can become very hard to kind of just pick, like, what is most important. What do I actually need to focus on? to gain him Amar and most importantly just become a more consistent and better player. Now in particular we'll be doing this for the carry role today, probably do this for every role at some point in the next month, but nonetheless we're just going to be focusing on the fundamentals. If you think this doesn't apply to you, you're wrong. It applies to everybody. So smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, we post here every single day and let's get into it. But before we do, quick announcement, there's a website. It's called GameLeap.com. I don't know if you've heard of it, but essentially everyone that signs up in the description down below gets a free pass to become broken. Yep, you heard that right. I know, it sounds too good to be true. It just it is what it is, you know? It really is what it is. Uh, you know, I'd say I'm lying to you guys, but you actually will just instantly become broken if you sign up. All right, let's get into it. So starting off with Arteezy's item build, we see something a little bit weird. What do we see that's weird? The Quelling Blade. Yeah, you heard that right. On top of that, He's actually laning in the bottom. Now the reason for this in particular is they must just feel like the matchup is simply better for him to go bottom. On top of that, something that I, I, I see with EG and a lot of pro teams, I know this is a bit off topic but I just want to cover it, is that they like sending their carry to the off lane and giving the off laner, right, the Death Prophet, a better start. Right, they give her a better game. I just think it's a, I think it's a smart thing to do, I think it's reasonable, so... Yeah, just want to put that out there. So the first thing I want to go over that makes him a good carry player and frankly just makes him a pro and also makes Fly a pro is their understanding of last hitting and denying. Now, a lot of you are probably going to be like, oh, I'm just going to skip this. I know, I know speed. I have to last hit and deny. No, but it's how you do it and it's how often you do it. Okay, let's look at this clip here and I want you guys to be honest with yourself and ask yourself how many of you would have contested these creeps in this way. First of all, he gets to deny under tower. You know, he's a beast. That's not the main one I want to talk about. The main one I want to talk about is this range creep. See how he pings it here? Do this in your pubs. If Arteezy does it with pro teammates who he's literally on mic with, you need to do it in your pubs. When there is a range creep that is going to be contested, you want your range support, assuming you have a range support, even if you have a melee one, if they're tanking and can contest it, you want them to hit it when it is half HP. You want to burst, deny it. That's exactly what they're going to look to do here. You know, ends up getting a little bit thrown off, Tomato being the good player that he is, understands the situation, he commits a blink strike to secure it, or at least prevent it from getting denied, but nonetheless, you gotta do that. Ping range creeps, and double hit denies. Most players never do this, except by accident. To be honest, the next thing that we have to go over, as, uh, <laughs> as simple as it is, is his raw ability to last hit. Besides the fact that he gets a courier, which technically gives him one extra last hit. I didn't even know that was a thing. Couriers give you last hits. <laughs> CSing is just, it's not impeccable, obviously, but it's very close to that. You'll see here he's getting pressure on the tower, draws aggro, secures that one, baits the edge to throw the auto attack by faking his animation, gets that one, right? He actually should have nuked that range creep. I don't know why he didn't, to be honest. I, I guess I'll just consider it a mistake, but he's able to get four out of the five CS under his tower while being contested. And yeah, I know it's just like speed, we get it, it's so simple. Just want to put it out there. A lot of players are just not worried enough. They don't care enough about every single creep. They don't hit it at the right time. They don't contest it at the right time. They don't know how to pull creep aggro correctly. And then they're like, oh, why am I stuck in my bracket? You can't even last it at a high level, right? It's like one of the, you know, most important, especially if you're a carry, fundamentals of Dota. The next thing I'd like to talk about is understanding your side of the map. What side are you on? Are you on Radiant or Dire? Now, what does this actually mean for carries? The main thing I'd like to know is when you're playing on Dire, it is extremely advantageous for heroes that have AoE clear to play their own jungle. Very often you want to play the triangle on Medusa, right? However, in this game in particular, not only does the Battle Rider potentially want to farm that area, most importantly what we want to consider is the ability to stack camps alone if you have a well no you actually don't need AoE damage in the Dire jungle but he can actually clear it by himself. So let's take a look at this, right? Whenever you're in the dire jungle with how it's currently set up, right? You can clear both of these camps by hitting them and you can stack them, right? Even this late, 55, he hits this camp. You can hit this camp at 53, then this one at 55 and you could stack it. But even with it being this late, he's able to get both of them. Then obviously he can farm it up. That's a really nice and high efficiency play that he makes here. Unfortunately, he does end up getting ganked in the jungle. 
But overall, you guys see what I'm saying? Like, that's understanding your side of the map. If he's radiant and he makes that same play, I mean, it's a thing. You know, you technically could bring this around and farm these two. It's not bad, it's just a bit harder. It's quite hard to stack, it's kind of inconvenient, so maybe he would spend a lot more time in the triangle. The next thing I'd like to discuss is going back to base. So for a lot of carry players and core players in general, going back to base sounds like the bane of their existence. After all, there's no creeps in your base. <laughs> I mean, come on, any carry players? You know, I'm not hitting creeps 24-7? I'm running down mid. No, but in all seriousness, like, it's okay to walk back to base. Right here, I want to ask you guys a question. How can he get his HP and mana back up without spending, like, 170 gold? Right, for Salvana Clarity. Sorry, 160. Right? He can't. He would have to spend 170 gold. And he's already basically at his base. He's defending a top tier 2 tower on a safe lane. This applies to both sides of the map. If he's defending this tower or this tower, you're very close to your base. It's, it's a short distance. And so walk it back. It's fine. Especially if you're a mid laner and you have a bottle or you're some hero with a massive mana pool. Even Medusa is a decent example. 800 mana, you know, 855 is quite high. It's fine. It's totally fine to go back to base. So much so that you're going to see his teammate, Ice Ice Ice, walking it back to base as well. It's totally reasonable if you're already there. Not always, but if you're basically already there, it's worth it. The next thing that Arteezy knows to do well is to defend his towers and only fight at towers. This entire game, he hasn't shown up to any team fights, rightfully so, he wouldn't want to. The only time he's, you know, fought is either when he was getting dove under a tower, dove in his jungle, or if his team is getting dove under their tower. Now, technically, right here, this isn't under the tower, but it's very close to it. It's to the point where there's no chance he dies, you know? It's not like he's going to die. It's a very advantageous fight because he's going to be able to pound the enemy from the back line. It's so all in all, it's, a, it's just a good decision to show up here. The snake allows him to get the slow onto Dubu, secure a kill, and he instantly transition into mid farm. So I just think that's a great example of understanding fight selection. Most players show up to everything. That's not good. You don't want to show up to everything. You want to show up to fights under your tower when you're a greedy hero. The next thing he does well is reading the map, okay? So right here, why does he go top? Because naturally, what is the most common farming rotations for, for carries? Clear triangle, go bottom. Why can he not do that here? It's good awareness, right? And, and just to be clear, what is the common mistake of most players? They clear the jungle and then they always walk to this side of the map. Just to be clear, guys, he's about to walk to this jungle. He's about to go from here to here, right? All the way around. But that's only because of the circumstances. This is not optimal for you know, most heroes, because you're not getting any lane creeps. For Dusa, you know, you farm the jungle quickly and you die easily in side lanes. You have no disengage. I mean, you have, you have stone gaze, but, you know, you could die easily. And the enemy team is also bottom. He knows this. The air spirit was just here. They're invading his jungle. They're in the general area. And so he shifts to the top lane. He goes from mid to top and he's going to avoid the gank. And this is important because as a carry player, what can often happen and what does often happen to a lot of people without them realizing it is what they do, all right, what they specifically do is that they are at a position on their carry so often that they completely grief the playmakers of their team, right? When their playmakers want to play bottom, or let's say they want to play top, okay? And you get picked off bottom because you overextend with your bad map awareness, you completely grief their game. They can't put pressure, they can't push in lanes, they're going to fall behind on farm because they have to TP to save you, and it ruins their game. For instance, if Ice 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 on Death Prophet couldn't push in any waves this game, he would simply fall off a cliff and have zero impact. The next thing that he understands is critical mass, or timings. In this game in particular, it's like a decent Dusa game when he gets items. The reason I say that is because Slark and Ricky in the early game, if they get on top of Dusa, you know, she struggles against them. She does, right? Uh, Slark has a defusal, Ricky will just, you know, simply backstab and smoke screener. And that, you know, sort of applies to the late game, but defusal falls off against Dusa, right? It's a flat number, it doesn't scale. And therefore, you know, early game Slark, while it destroys Medusa, uh, late game, not as much. It's not a great matchup, I would say, but it's it's okay. Right? It's at least okay. Stone Gaze can protect you for, for long enough in a team fight. But basically what I'm trying to say is that he really wants to get the Scotty this game. Once he gets the Scotty, it really destroys OD. That's the number one thing. Scotty is like the hardest counter in the game to OD. I really mean that. Like the BKB piercing slow and attack speed and movement speed slow by 50% is, is quite insane. So he really wants to get to that timing. So just because he has Manta doesn't mean he's going to go sicko mode. A lot of people are like, oh, I got one big item. 
I'm going in. Don't do that, right? Get your Manta. Let's say you're playing Dusa. Get your Manta, and now you can push in waves. You can jungle and push in waves. It's great. The next thing that he does well is he uses his items properly. In this game in particular, he has Manta. So anytime you have Manta, it's very important that you use your illusions to push waves and your hero farm the jungle, right? Your hero can die, your illusions... Well, they can die, but who cares if they die? And so here, his team wants to get out of top. They don't have, you know, the spells they necessarily want. I think they just used Echo here, right? So no Echo. I think they have no Lasso. Two big spells, right? And so they don't want to take an engagement. And they leave, right? They leave. Uh, and this is just a good decision, because not only is he able to get his illusions off to the top lane and potentially get a full wave, he's also able to get back to the Ancients as soon as possible and finish up his Scotty at the 23 minute mark, which is a quite good timing. And this fight here is going to show you why timings are so important. The higher you grow, and I hope everyone who watches Game Leap continues to gain MMR and reach extremely high heights, 6k, 7k, k MMR, you know, what you'll realize as a carry player is if you show up to all the wrong fights and you don't have the right farming patterns and miss stack timers and miss CS in lane, that small difference can lose you the entire game. It really can. For instance, right here, 24 minutes in, not long into the game, he has two items, and yeah, he's been getting run at quite a bit. It's not the freest game of his life. It's not terrible, but it's it's not not the best. He's been run at by Slark and by the OD, uh, and so on. But nonetheless, this fight breaks out. No Death Prophet. However, it ends up being a pretty good fight. Why? Well, the reason why is because he has a Scotty. He also gets his Stone Gaze off at a good time, which, you know, basically turns the OD into Stone. Good Witch Doctor ulti onto the OD as well. And now you can see the Scotty come into play. The OD can move at all, right, whatsoever. Ricky's trying to do damage to Medusa, but it's really to no avail. It's just not. I mean, he's doing nothing. Like, literally nothing. I mean, he's trying, but it's doing nothing. And because of this, uh, they end up killing a lot of heroes. And I mean, a lot. Another thing that I'd like to say about Medusa that's an important thing to understand is you tend to want the enemy team to sort of run at you. You know, you don't really die, and if they kill your teammates, very often they can cut you out. So what ends up being good that fight, just to be clear, is that when they jump his team, he's close enough to the point where they sort of focus him as well, and they all stay in range of multi-shot, and it's also very easy follow-up for the Shaker. The Shaker is able to protect him and follow up his Stone Gaze rather than, you know, throwing some crazy bad echo that he can't follow up on the Dusa because he's out of position. And that's going to be about all for today's video. Um, we're not ending it there yet, so don't click off. But uh, as you look into this fight, you can already see because of the bug, he gets a triple kill. And yeah, it's just because he hit his timings. I mean, he, he's done a great job of showing up to the fights that he needs to. Protects his teammate here, right? Great stone gaze. You see that positioning? That is something that only a very, very high MR player would consider. Because most players, how do they play Dota? They look at their own game and they try to optimize it. Which is kind of reasonable. It sort of works in solo queue. You don't, you know, you want to amp yourself. Kind of. A lot of people grief their own games too much. Like, there's kind of like both ends usually, you know what I mean? Like, what, what I'm saying is essentially some people just like grief their own game and never farm to try to help their team show up to every fight type of thing. And some people, they, they only play for their own game and they never help their teammates, even in team fights, right? And this is kind of a great example of that awareness. Uh, it's a great pounce by the Slark onto the Earthshaker. However, it's an even better body block from the Medusa, right? Forces Stone Gaze. Slark obviously doesn't want to man up and get gazed in his ulti. That would put him in quite a weird position. And then, yeah, the Medusa is going to go to town. I mean, the damage he's doing at this point in the game is quite insane. And that's the end of that fight. But yeah, for a quick little Roshan, they're obviously just going to go up high ground. Uh, I mean, this Medusa is, is ridiculously farmed. 21,000 net worth at the 32 minute mark. That's like, what, 800 something GPM? Pretty insane. And uh, yeah, after forcing the Slark back and shoving in some waves, they're going to walk it up high ground. But yeah, thank you guys for watching so much. I appreciate you all, especially the people who watched to the end of the video. Watch the whole video. I really do appreciate that. Watch time, you know, it, it's always so high on all the videos. And I do appreciate you guys enjoying the content and, and supporting the content as well. And of course, I hope it helps you as well. But thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. And peace. But yeah, that's going to be about all, folks. Remember, click the link down below and subscribe to the Game Leap website where we have thousands of videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.